of the Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown. One minute from Mark. One minute. Stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with Dr. Michael Brown. 30 seconds until hour number one from Mark. That was our final verbal time check for the line of fire with Dr. Michael Brown. We'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before, followed by a short one at five seconds. Have a great afternoon, everybody. I have two guests on today's broadcast, one the descendant of slaves, the other a descendant of slave owners. They've come together in Jesus with a great message today. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. As always, here on The Line of Fire, it is our goal to build up, not to tear down, to bless and to strengthen and to encourage and to help. So we'll tell the truth, we'll tackle controversial issues, we'll wade into difficult waters, but not for the sake of controversy, not just for some heat without light, but always with the goal of building up, strengthening, encouraging, and rallying God's people around the truth and appealing to those with different views, to hear what we have to say. Welcome to the Line of Fire, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. A little later in the broadcast, I'm going to bring on two guests. Together they have an important message to get out. They both stand together in the pro-life movement, one a black American, the other a white American, one the descendant of slaves, the other the descendant of slave owners. So it's an important message that they have for everyone today. And I urge you to call a friend, text them, shoot them a note, and tell them to tune in to the line of fire. Okay. I do first want to address the latest developments in the Justice Kavanaugh hearings. And then I want to speak to you as well about some science, some information that transgender activists don't want you to hear don't want you to know. In fact, in fact, when Brown University published a recent study linked to a recent study, scientific study about sudden onset of gender confusion in children past puberty, uh, it was polled because transgender activists were offended by it. So we'll get to that in a little while as well. 866 Three, four, truth. That is the number to call. Okay. I I posted a question just seconds ago, literally, and immediately before we started the show. So we'll just get the first trickle of responses coming in. But I asked this question on Twitter What's your take if another Republican were president and had nominated Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court? Would the opposition to him be just as intense? In other words, are liberals primarily fighting Trump? or primarily fighting Kavanaugh. And I gave the choices of Trump, Kavanaugh, equal mixture of both, not sure. And it's just the first few dozen votes coming in, but I'll keep you posted on that. If you'd like to weigh in, give me a call, 866-348-7884. Here's what I want to say. And I'm not saying this as a Republican or a Democrat because I'm an independent. And I'm not saying this as a supporter or a critic of the president. I'm saying this as best as I can from someone watching and trying to look at things honestly. The behavior of Democrats at the hearing yesterday for Justice Kavanaugh, to me, was embarrassing, even despicable. 
And if the reports are true that Chuck Schumer coordinated the attacks, the, coordinated how they were going to interrupt and immediately call for adjournment, and, and we haven't gotten access to certain documents, and of course, many of the documents are, are not direct writings of Justice Kavanaugh, but rather documents from the Bush White House that they don't have access to because they're deemed confidential and really unrelated to the confirmation hearings of Justice Kavanaugh. To coordinate this, if true, you say, well, the reports are out. I'm still saying, if true, that this was a coordinated effort to shut down the hearings. That's childish, that's immature, that's beneath our elected officials. You say, well, look at how Donald Trump acts. And when he does, I say that's wrong for him. Now, you may get mad at me from both sides, but rather than get mad at me from both sides, understand that I'm calling for civility and maturity from all sides. Just like I didn't like it when candidate, McCain, uh, candidate Trump went after John McCain, and I didn't like it when John McCain's funeral was used to, in a backhanded way, attack President Trump. And I don't like it when Donald Trump sends out tweets about one journalist and says he thinks like a degenerate fool. And I don't like it when these Democrats act like children. And you've got all the protesters that you, you want to make the pro-abortion movement look as ugly as it is. Just get these kind of protesters screaming and yelling and disrupting meetings. And, and what's, what's interesting to, to add to all this is the type of dirt and stuff that people are trying to come up with that simply doesn't exist. It's mind boggling. And then how about one of the senators? Senator Durbin saying plainly that a lot of his opposition is to Donald Trump and that Trump has behaved in such a way that now Durbin's going to pose his nominee. I mean, you, you talk about, well, you threw sand on me. I'm going to throw sand on you. You were mean to me. I'm going to be mean to you. I don't justify it on any side. It grieves me on all sides. You say, well, President Trump was not the first one to be divisive. Absolutely. I agree. I believe the presidency of President Obama, although of a different nature, was divisive in its own way and exacerbated racial tensions here in America. And I believe Donald Trump has added fuel to the fire and other elected officials have added more fuel to the fire. And we've got ourselves one big mess. So here's my appeal. I can't affect, I can pray, but I can't directly affect the behavior of President Trump anymore than you can. I can pray, you can pray, but I can't directly affect the behavior of Senator Chuck Schumer or Dick Durbin or others, Senator Brooker, Senator Harris. I, I, can't, I can't do that anymore than you can. But what I can do is control what I say. What I can do is think through how I speak. What I can do is measure my words and seek to set an example that others can follow. And I know by God's grace that lots of folks listen to the broadcast, watch the broadcast, read our articles, listen and watch and read other things that we put out. And in everything we do, we seek to be your voice. And in everything we, we do, we seek to honor the Lord. And, and yet, look, if, if I was ever put forward, and in, in let's, let's say that, that I was also a justice, and I was in you know, the courts, and someone wanted to put me up for some high uh, appointment to a federal court, I could blast it out instantly. I mean, it wouldn't be a matter of, of a half a second of vetting because I've spoken out on too many controversial subjects. And, and even if I didn't speak out on those, just my spiritual beliefs, just get one of my tape series on prayer, one of my tape series on spiritual warfare, tape series, call them tape series. I mean, that's how far back they go. You know, get one of our audio series on any of those things, or listen to some of my messages in the midst of revival or read things that I've written about the things of the spirit. And yeah, obviously, well, you're crazy, man. You believe in that. You believe in God acting like miracles or divine intervention or God speaking or tongues or yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm not trying to position myself in a way that the world will just like me. And I'm not encouraging you to position yourself in a way where you, you throw your beliefs in the closet. So people will like you. I'm talking about acting with civility. I'm talking about acting with grace. I'm talking about conducting ourselves in a way that's befitting as ambassadors of the Lord. 
Some people say, well, I look at the way Jesus rebuked those Pharisees in Matthew 23, and he didn't hold back, so that's how I'm going to speak. Well, friend, you're not Jesus. And perhaps when Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees for hypocrisy and self-righteousness, he's also rebuking us sometimes when we walk in those things. And rather than us thinking that we can't point the finger the same way that he did, best to look at our own lives and examine our own hearts and say, Lord, are any of those tendencies in me? Because many of those leaders whom Jesus rebuked were highly respected by the people, but God saw the hearts. Yeah, I read about another scandal. Two Catholic priests, in case their kids listening, I won't say what was happening, but they were in a car in public in Chicago doing things that ought not to be done in public or in private for two men. Catholic priests! And, and, and what was it, 3.20 in the afternoon? And, and so oblivious to what they were doing that cops had a knock on the window of their car to get their attention. Of course, they were arrested for what they did. Well, that's grievous, and that's ugly, and it happened to be two men, and they happened to be Catholic, so we could point our finger at homosexuals. We could point our finger at the Catholics. And they're, they're culpable. There's a lot of sin in the Catholic priesthood, and a lot of it is homosexual. That's true. But I hear a report like that. I grieve because these men are known to represent Jesus. No, I don't agree with their theology. But in the society, they are known to represent Jesus. That's what grieves me. And then I immediately think of all the heterosexual sin that's out there and the sin that's in the evangelical church. And then I search my own heart for purity. In other words, my first reaction is, is not just to condemn them. They're, they're guilty. And, and in many ways, they've destroyed their lives here by what they've done. And they've brought reproach to the Catholic Church and to the priesthood. And, and to the extent they're identified with Jesus, they brought reproach to his name. And, and what they did is reprehensible, inexcusable period. But, but I don't need to get on a high horse and just attack them. The better thing to do is to say, hey, how about in our own house? What about the sin in our own camp? How can we clean that up? Well, yes, let the Catholic Church deal righteously with its own mess. And to date, I don't believe that it has, even nearly, even touched it. Anyway, all that to say, uh, I'm watching what's happening in the Senate. I'm watching senators, either they're just trying to get good sound bites to use for TV ads running for president, which other senators have accused them of, or, or they, are, they are further exposing the infantile, irrational opposition to a pro-life conservative or simply to a conservative constitutionalist. Whatever it is, it, it makes them look bad. I can't imagine that any except those really staunchly on the left think well of what they're doing and are praising them and saying, way to go. I'm sure some are, but to me, that's got to be the minority. And if Republicans acted like this, I'd be just as embarrassed. Thinking, what in the world are we doing? We're hurting a cause. And again, I'm saying that not as a Republican, but as a conservative. If conservatives were doing it, I'd be embarrassed. And when the president does it, I'm embarrassed. How, how about we read through the book of Proverbs? This is my first counsel in my open letter to President Trump, candidate Trump in August of 2015, the first time I focused on him or addressed him. How about looking at the Proverbs of Solomon and trying to live by them? Especially he spoke a lot to kings, didn't he? All right, we'll be right back with some important information. You know, we talk about scriptures being the word of God. It's also clear they were written by human beings, that, that Paul tells Timothy, hey, please bring my cloak, and it's going to be cold here in the winter when I'm in prison. And it's interesting that when Ezekiel says, thus saith the Lord, that his words come out different than when Isaiah says, thus saith the Lord, or Jeremiah says, thus saith the Lord. So how do we explain that? Is the Bible written by God or men? 2 Timothy 3.16 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All scripture is breathed out by God. How can it be 
breathed out by God and yet come in so many different human forms. Someone used this analogy once. When the light shines through a window, that the, the light on one side of the window is slightly different than on the other side. What if the light shined through colored glass? Now it's going to come out very different on the other side. But what if God, who made the light, also made the glass so that through the multicolored panels on that glass window, that stained glass window, the light came out on the other side just the way he intended. So yes, of course, the Bible is full of humanity. It's full of human emotion. The Bible is full of human expression and human vocabulary and human distinctives from one culture to another. And yet it is breathed out by God so that we get the very word of God, just what God wanted to communicate to us, we get in an absolutely inspired, infallible form. So yes, it is the word of God through man, but inspired by God, breathed out by God, so we can say the scriptures are the word of God. Cleansing flame, send the fire. It's the line of fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Hey, just a reminder of this important announcement. I mentioned my open letter to Donald Trump August of 2015, reaching out and saying, hey, here are some, here are some suggestions for you free of charge. And uh, that was the first of, oh, over 100 articles over a three-year period where I addressed issues with candidate Trump and then Republican candidate Trump and for the presidency, then once he had won the Republican nomination, and then President Trump uh, honest observations, why I voted for him after initially opposing him, concerns I had, what's been good, what's been bad. We've put those together in chronological order, which makes for a really fascinating read. Plus, you can jump wherever you want. Grab, you can grab Donald Trump did not die for my sins, or have we sold our souls to Donald Trump, or a word to the never Trumpers, or whatever it is. You can just pick any one, but they're all laid out chronologically with brand new essay at the beginning, Evangelicals and Donald Trump, a match made in heaven or a marriage with hell. And then brand new closing material. Where do we go from here? Seven lessons that we've learned. What do we do with the midterm elections and beyond? We've put it all together in a brand new book, Donald Trump is Not My Savior. An evangelical leader speaks out, speaks his mind about the man he supports as president. You'll find it eye opening and whatever side of the issue you're on, I think you'll find it helpful. So the book is available for pre-order, any of the standard carriers, Amazon and others, but we are printing 500 copies in hardcover. This is exclusive only through our ministry. We'll also sign them and number them. So you may get copy number 41 or 11 or 106. And it's personally, yeah, I'll, I'll inscribe a note to you and, and with a scripture and sign it. We do it for each one. You can only get those through our website. And this is a way where you can be a blessing to us and help us with our radio broadcast. And this is a way we can get something special in your hand, kind of a collector's item. So go to askdrbrown.org. You'll see it right there on the homepage. Okay. If you are the parent of a child struggling with gender identification, confusion, now called gender dysphoria, if, if you're the parent of a six or seven-year-old child there is help, there is counsel, there are things that can be done to help this child work through the confusion, and it's best to reinforce biology, and the great majority of these kids, once they go past puberty, won't even have these struggles anymore. This has been scientifically documented, but obviously this needs compassion, wisdom, but what you don't want to do is affirm them and their confusion and tell your daughter that she's actually a boy, even if it seems to give her relief. There's a good website, helpforfamilies.com. That's help number four, families.com. And you'll find some good resources there put together by Denise Schick, whose own dad confided in her when she was just nine and said that he really believed he was a woman and then lived as a woman in the years after that. But now there's a new phenomenon that more and more reports are coming of 
older kids, even kids past puberty, who are suddenly saying, I, I think I'm a boy trapped in a girl's body. I think I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body. I, I, I want to have sex change surgery. I want to get on hormones. I, I, I need to do it. And, and people have been asking why this sudden increase and, and what's it due to? Now, obvious answer would be it's, it's the climate of the day. It's the, it's the spirit of the age. It's the thing now. It's everybody talking about it. And you got kids going through emotional ups and downs and, and maybe different confusion in their own lives and in lack of good role models and on and on. Maybe they're getting confused. So there was a study done. All right, this is a scientific study uh, on the uh, PLOS Plus One website. You can get it now, uh, see there, and, and their journal. Rapid onset gender dysphoria in adolescents and young adults, a study of parental reports. Let me read that again. It was, it was a study done by Lisa Littman. Rapid onset gender dysphoria in adolescents and young adults, a study of parental reports. Now, critics have said this is based on parental reports, and obviously there is limited data to go by. But what was seen was that certain things led to these sudden changes, to this rapid onset of gender dysphoria. In other words, the kid or the young adult suffered from maybe depression and they started to binge watch uh, transgender videos and suddenly became convinced that's them. That, uh, that's me. That's me. I'm really a girl in a boy's body. I'm, I'm a woman in a man's body. And, and in other words, it was the exposure of social media and other influences that led to this. And they kept, found it in case after case after case after case and published this as a scientific study. So it was posted by Brown University. And here's an article by Brandon Showalter a few days back on Christian Post. Brown U scrubs website of gender confusion amid pressure from trans activists. And he tells us Brown University has removed an article on gender confusion in young people from its website amid complaints from transgender activists. The Ivy League University in Rhode Island said Monday, so this was posted August 30th, that it decided to take down a news story by Lisa Lippman, a member of the faculty in the Department of Public Health, which was recently published in the scientific journal PLOS One, because it could be seen as unsupporting of the transgender community. Lippman's peer-reviewed study, Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria in Adolescents and Young Adults, a study of parental reports examined hundreds of detailed surveys of parents whose adolescent and young adult children began experiencing gender confusion and identifying as transgender, her research found that the worsening of mental well-being and parent-child relationships and behaviors that isolate adolescents and young adults from their parents, family, friends who did not self-identify as trans and mainstream sources of information are particularly concerning. In other words, there are outside influences on these teenagers and young adults that are causing them to suddenly think, well, that's me, I'm, I'm transgender. And, and what is also... Uh, what's also being found is when this is not given into, when there's recognition something else is going on, that it's, it's not long after that, that some of these or many of these, I don't have all the stats in front of me, the kids no longer feel that way. Look, I was talking to a middle school teacher in Charlotte, North Carolina, some years ago. I'd say it was at least five years ago. And she was a young woman, Jewish background, very liberal in her thinking, maybe 30-ish again, teaching middle schoolers. And she said, oh, it's the new thing. It's the in thing. And she was fine with it. She said, it's the in thing. Now kids coming out as gay. It's cool. And she said, the other day, a 12-year-old boy in her class came, came out and said, I'm gay. The next day, he came back to her and said, can, can I take that back? I think I made a mistake. Can, <laughs> can you take that back? Do you, you say it and you take it? Is, is, that, is that the depth of this? I'm not blaming the kid. That's the environment in which our kids, grandkids are being raised. That's what they are being exposed to. That's what some of you are being exposed to. And it doesn't mean you're, you're totally unstable. It just means that at formative key times in your life, you're getting hit with all kinds of junk you shouldn't be getting hit with. Now, a friend sent me this article 
uh, published in The Economist, September 1st, 2018, called Gender Dysphoria Transparenting. A paper suggests that the increase in the number of trans teenage girls is partly a social phenomenon. And it tells the story of Jeanette Miller growing up and maybe being tomboyish and different things or having an interest in a girl at a certain point in her life, but now saying she's transgender, she wants to have a mastectomy, she wants to have her breast removed, she wants to go on hormones, and her mother's saying, we're not going to have that, and then being in tension and fighting about it, and then Jeanette coming out of that, no longer feeling that way. And the article ends by saying this, Squashing research risks injuring the health of an unknown number of troubled adolescent girls. Rachel, now, I'm sorry, Jeanette Miller is the mother. Rachel is the daughter. Rachel, on 21, believes she latched on to a trans identity as a way of coping with on-off depression and being sexually abused as a child. After receiving therapy, her gender dysphoria disappeared. Had her mother affirmed her gender identity as a 16-year-old with several gender therapists urged, Rachel would have embarked on a medical transition that she turned out not to want after all. Wow. Wow. And trans activists are trying to squash this information. Why? Because so it's, it's, it's going to hurt their cause, and it's going to make people question whether they're really trans or not. Hey, hey, listen, listen. You're talking about a girl, a young woman, that could have had her breast removed, that could have put hormones into her body to make her the opposite of who she really was. And then just with a little help and counsel, she could have resolved her problem. I mean, look, if, if you are convinced, you're absolutely convinced that your right arm has to go, that it's causing you torment and pain and that you're only meant to have a left arm, and you go to see any self-respecting doctor, they're, they're going to get you psychological help. They're not going to hack your arm off. And, and what if someone hacks your arm off and you find out afterwards, oh, this was a psychological issue. If I had gotten help from the inside out, I'd have both arms. Unfortunately, we're not giving that help to many struggling with transgender identity. And it is help that we need to give. All right. We come back. Matt Lockett, Will Ford are going to join me for a fascinating interview. One, son of slave owners, descendant of slave owners. The other, the descendant of slaves. You know, you often hear the term biblical worldview, but, but what is a biblical worldview? Okay, a worldview is how we look at the world, how we look at moral, cultural issues, how we look at life, okay? If we were animals, we're going to have a worldview. We're surviving, and some animals eat other animals, and other animals run from other animals, and you don't have a worldview, but we have a worldview. We, we put value on things. We believe things are right and wrong. And our worldview is based on the Bible being true. Our worldview is based on God creating us, God creating us in his image, there being right and wrong in his sight, there being absolute moral value. So to have a biblical worldview is to look at the world, to look at culture, to look at family, to look at relationships, to look at decisions we make, through the lens of scripture and through the perspective that we will give account to God and that we live and walk with God here in this world. Now, Paul says something very interesting in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He's talking about the life he once lived, how he once looked at people. Now that he meets Jesus, look at what he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. He said, from now on though, having come to know Jesus and being born from above, Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, meaning just on a human level. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. So in other words, he's saying, 
I once looked at Jesus just in natural terms and didn't realize who he was and completely misjudged him. So if I, if I meet someone, whether it's the president of the United States or a beggar on the street, that's someone created in the image of God who needs Jesus. I, I, if I look at some Hollywood celebrity, that's like, oh, can I have your water? I want to have your autograph. No, rather, how can I lead you to really know the Lord? Because you're a person like everybody else. I'm going to have a different perspective on people, a different perspective on this world, a different perspective on life in the womb, a different perspective on right and wrong. And, and here's what's interesting. A, a, a massive, overwhelming percentage of millennials, I, I mean, the vast, 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 vast majority, according to the polls, do not have a biblical worldview. I mean, 98, 99% from what I've read don't have a biblical worldview. Why? Well, obviously, many have not been nurtured in it through their parents, okay? The parents have not done an adequate job of grounding their kids in the Word and in a biblical worldview. Or maybe we're just so narrow, quoted the Bible here and there, but never applied it to all of life. And they haven't had that encounter with Jesus that Paul had. I don't mean on the same level, but that same recognition of not looking at things through natural eyes. Many have a heart for justice and want to see good, but they don't get the larger perspective, God's perspective, because of which their worldview is limited through an encounter with the Lord and His Word will have a biblical worldview. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Hey, can I, can I talk to you candidly from the heart as I always do on the broadcast here? I don't remember in my lifetime, I'm 63 now, I don't remember in my lifetime a, a, a moment where we were more divided as a nation. In the 60s, we had a massive generation gap grow up, and obviously I was part of that in my teen years in rebellion before I knew the Lord. So we had a lot of division and upheaval then, but the degree of division today between left and right, between ethnicities and races, it seems to me more volatile and deeper than I can remember in my lifetime. And at times like this, it's very easy for us to get caught up in partisan politics, caught up in ethnic offenses, caught up in racial issues, as opposed to getting caught up with God's plan and God's agenda and bringing that to bear on the very real issues that surround us, that we need to address as God's people, as salt, as light, as ambassadors for Jesus, the Messiah. There's a new book out called The Dream King. And in this book, descendants of slaves and slave owners offer inspiring challenge to usher in racial healing for our nation. And both of the gentlemen I'm about to bring on are colleagues I've worked with in different settings or sat face-to-face -face with and prayed and brainstormed together. Will Ford, the third, is the director of Marketplace Leadership, major at Christ for the Nations Institute. He's also the founder of Hilkia or Hilkiah Ministries. And Matt Lockett is the executive director of the Justice House of Prayer, D.C., located right on Capitol Hill in Washington. From the governmental gate of the nation, Matt leads prayer and intercession that appeals to a holy hill that's higher than Capitol Hill, to a heavenly court that's above the Supreme Court. Will and Matt, welcome to the broadcast. Hey, thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Brown. It's good to be with you today. All right. So, Will, you are a descendant of slaves. How long have you known that? You know, uh, I grew up knowing it in, in my family, partly because of uh, the history of slavery that was passed down connected to a story that's uh, connected to this 200-year-old kettle pot that was in my family. Mm. Uh, it was used by the slaves in my family. They used it for cooking. They used it for washing clothes. But secretly, they, they used it for prayer. Uh, the way the story is passed down is that the, the, the slave master didn't want them to pray because he felt like if they prayed, they were false to hope. If they got hopeful, uh, he felt like they would run away. So he literally would beat them if he heard them praying. But these folks were Christians, and, and Dr. Brown, they, they prayed anyway. They would go into a barn at night, take that cast iron pot with them, and uh, they went to the barn at night so their prayers weren't you know seen, but to make sure they weren't heard, they took that pot in there with them, and they turned it upside down on the cabin floor. They inverted it propped it up with a rock, with several rocks underneath the edges of it, so it'd be propped up about an inch or two. Then they would prostrate themselves on the ground mm. and pray underneath the opening between the ground and the kettle, so that that kettle muffled their voices as they prayed through the night. And the story that was passed down with this pot and this kettle 
is this is my family, is, is that they didn't think they would see freedom in their time, so they prayed for the freedom of their children in the next generation. And so that story is passed down from generation to generation to generation in my family, and uh, that's that's how I was connected to the storyline of that. But it was a storyline of hope, you know, though while we understood that all, all the difficult things and the atrocity uh, of, of in, in, in the inhumanity of slavery, we also saw the great triumph that our Christian faith gave us. Yeah. And I Incredible. began to study about the, you know, the, the not just the black Christian slaves, but also the white Christian abolitionists back then who knew that if any person was a slave was a Christian, they knew that person was their brother. And these folks laid their lives down for those brothers. They, they had their houses burned even. They were shot, killed, and lynched because they chose to suffer with the people of God rather than compromise and weaken slavery. And it was the prayers of that godly remnant of black Christian slaves and white Christian abolitionists that I believe prayed into being the first and the second great awakening. Had it not been for those revivals, slavery would have never ended in this nation. Incredible. Uh, it's amazing perspective, Will, and obviously we'll come back to that in a moment. And then, Matt, on your end, I guess this is not the kind of tradition that you proudly pass on like like Will's family did in terms of the message of hope and prayer and faith, but when did you find out that you were a descendant of slave owners? Well, I didn't know that until just recently. I uh, was uh, became, became a Christian when I was a teenager, but you know this wasn't anything that uh, was ever discussed in our family, mostly because my family didn't have any insight into our genealogy. We actually couldn't get back uh, further than my dad's grandfather because there had been uh, a loss of courthouse records because of fires or, you know, really just it came down to somebody stopped telling the stories. And so my family never really knew where we came from. And uh, I got my life kind of radically turned upside down and around and shaken uh, back in 2005 and uh, found myself leaving a career in the marketplace and moving to Washington, D.C. to be a, a prayer missionary on Capitol Hill. And uh, I met Will Ford. And we spent about a decade uh, being friends, being uh, really just kind of brothers in the Lord and running together in ministry because we had a common we had a common heart for revival, a common heart to see God move on uh, the racial issue in, in America, but then also on the pro-life issue. And so we spent about a decade just praying together and leading prayer meetings all around the nation, uh, only to find out later that there was a uh, all of this history involved. And so it's only been recently that I found this out. Extraordinary. And, and again, what joined you together was your heart for revival and your heart for the unborn. Will, knowing your history, knowing what was done to bring liberation and, and the cost to bring liberation, uh, there's a great concern that, that we have. You and I have talked about it face to face. In, in terms of the toll that the pro abortion movement has taken, on the Black American community. Does your own background make you even more sensitive to that when you're looking at, at a Black genocide of, of unparalleled proportions? Yeah, you know, uh, when, we, when it comes to dealing with the race issue in this nation, one of the things that gets left out of the, out of the narrative and is kind of pulled away and it's actually become like the pink elephant in the room is eugenics. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about racism in terms of what happened during slavery. We talk about what happened with redlining. We talk about what happened, what's happening with mass incarceration. But what people leave out of the storyline is the fact that it was the eugenics uh, society of America, and it was the eugenics uh, elite that were a part of that. And that's everybody from uh, C.J. Gamble. That's everybody connected to Margaret Sanger and others that were the proponents for mass incarceration. They were the proponents for uh, population control. And that gets left out. And so until we deal with that, we're really not going to tug away at the, at, the, at the whole issue of dealing with racism in this nation until we address that. And it goes all the way to this whole thing of not just, you know, remember the whole thing of black people being uh, dehumanized years ago, and people didn't like the fact that, of course, we'd be being depicted as apes and monkeys and different things like cartoons and and the way uh, different people were treated, and uh, how the eugenic society actually said that black people were closer to being apes and monkeys than uh, and closer to being uh, uh, the rest of humanity. Well, when you start to dehumanize anybody, it's easier to marginalize them and eliminate them. 
And we've done that not only with African Americans, we've done that literally with the child in the womb. Because when you when the people that we cannot see become optional, it's inevitable that some of the people that we can see will become marginal. Mm. So until we deal with the life issue, we won't, you can't get into this whole aspect of everybody mattering in this nation. There's a lot of people saying all lives matter, black lives matter, even folks trying to say white lives matter. The deal is just God is saying drill down deeper, life matters. And it's one of the quintessential things that's dealing with to, 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 to handling the race issue that we actually uh, address it in the book as well. All right, all right. So, Matt, the, the book, The Dream King, sharing stories of the fulfillment of Dr. Martin Luther King's Jr.'s dream, uh, we hear so much bad news today. Uh, we're flooded with it day and night. And that's the hot news, the big news. And it's always so divisive and volatile. And, and you, you're, you love this one. You hate this one. What, what does your book do? And, and why is it so needed at a volatile time in American history? Well, there's certainly no shortage of opinions. I'm actually up here on the Hill today praying uh, for the confirmation hearings for this vacancy on the Supreme Court. And so all the opinions are on full display. Uh, I'm entrenched in it right now. But here's the thing. God's been at work for quite some time. And, and I think we lose sight of this, that our lives are set against a bigger backdrop of a, a providential hand of God. Uh, you know, we, we get our eyes focused on the problem in front of us or even the problems in our individual lives, and we lose sight of the fact that that God has determined in advance the, the places where we would live, the times that we would live. Acts 17 makes that very clear. And, uh, and those circumstances are designed that we might search for Him and find Him, though He's not far from any of us. And so uh, what the book is, is uh, doing is uh, we've discovered a storyline that doesn't just involve my life and Will's life, but, but we found the threads connecting back through centuries of history, and it reveals the hidden hand of God and how He has been carefully weaving things together. And I think this is the message that we need to understand. Certainly believers need to know this, but I think unbelievers need to know this. There's a, there a storyline that God is telling and each and every one of us are an important part of it. The lives that we've been given are an integral part of what God is wanting to do. And so I think when you get that perspective, I think it's the right perspective. I think it's a healthy perspective, but it's a life-giving perspective because suddenly our lives have meaning. And even the, the, you know, the, the tragic circumstances, the trauma of our life, suddenly we can find meaning in it and purpose that I think I think, you know, God God uh, allows us to go through difficult things so he can produce a prayer. You know, certainly that's true of my life and Will's as well. And so I think that's what the book's trying to do here uh, is just to reveal the hidden hand of God and how he's been working on this story for a long time. Mm, the book by Will Ford and Matt Lockett, The Dream King. Uh, we'll, we'll open this up more on the other side of the break, and I want to get an example or two of, of God being at work. We just got about a minute before the break, but do you think— that we're too focused on the bad news and not noticing what God is doing? What do you think about that, Will? Well, you know, I, I think we, we it's, it's our propensity to, to focus on the bad news, especially, you know, if you're in the news business, that's the stuff that sells the best. But listen, there are, there are, there are amazing things that are happening. I'm not just talking like the, the silver lining and, and some kind of cloud kind of, you know, ethereal thing. I'm thinking, I'm saying God is actually doing some things that are amazing, not just in the story with Matt and I, but we've been recognizing and getting stories from all around the country mm. from, from people when we talk, and God is doing amazing things with healing the racial divide. I tell you and, what, I'm, uh, I'm going to interrupt you right there, and that's where we're going to pick up. Let, let's let's get one of the stories that's in your book about how God is healing the racial divide in America and how you can be part of that healing process. The new book, The Dream King. We'll be right back. Is Satan everywhere at the same time? Is the devil omnipresent? I see no scriptural emphasis on that or no scriptural backing for that whatsoever. God alone is omnipresent. Angels are not omnipresent. Created beings are not omnipresent. And Satan is both a created being and an angel, a fallen 
created being, a fallen angel. You know, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, Matthew chapter four, verse 11, after Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, it says this, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So Satan left, angels came. Neither of them are omnipresent. Just because Satan is a spirit being and we can't see him, you can have the feeling, well, he's omnipresent. No, only God fills the universe. Uh, only is it said of God in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Only of God, as it says in Jeremiah 23, that he fills heaven and earth. It's not said of Satan. Satan is not omnipresent. Satan is a powerful, dark, spiritual being, very powerful, very deceptive, and he has a well-organized army of demon powers under him, whether those are fallen angels or wherever we get the class of demons from, and, and they are sent out. And when we resist demons, we are resisting Satan. When it tells us in 1 Peter 5 to resist Satan, it doesn't mean that each of us is personally resisting him because he's everywhere at the same time. No, he comes and he goes. Just like in Matthew, the fourth chapter, he leaves and looks for more opportune time. Satan is not omnipresent. Let's not give him credit he doesn't deserve. Only God is almighty. Only God is omniscient. Only God is omnipresent. Absolutely not Satan. Author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Friends, I'm speaking with Will Ford and Matt Lockett. They have been on the front lines of the pro-life movement for years now. They've joined together with a message of racial healing for America, their new book, Dream King, where they look at God's hand in history and to this moment, working to bring about racial reconciliation. So, Will, give us an example, a story you tell in the book of God's hand working today to bring about racial unity and racial reconciliation. Well, really, it's just the, 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 the tip of the iceberg kind of uh, understanding of our story. The beautiful thing about Matt and I's story is this, that here we are, we've, these two guys, we both were led to the Lincoln Memorial on MLK Celebration Day, uh, January 17, 2005. Matter of fact, uh, Dr. Brown, you actually were there in uh, that. In that well, hang, hang on. Can, can I just mention one other thing? It was yeah. that day. So we put the life tape on our mouth, the red tape yeah. with life written on it. We walked in the right. freezing cold. It was like maybe two miles. <laughs> All right. And we all prayed silently. That's right. That's when the Holy Spirit spoke to me, reach out and resist, and brought together what had been building in me for several months about a calling having to do with LGBT issues. It, the T really wasn't there yet. Wow. Reach out wow. to the people with compassion, resist the agenda with courage. I, I journaled that as that moment when that word codified in my heart, reach out and resist. So I, I, remember, I remember that very well. Okay, so you guys were both led there that day. Yeah, we both were. We didn't know each other then. We ah. both were led there by dreams. I had a dream about Martin Luther King, which I detail in the book where God began to deal with me about my own racial baggage that I had from from, from growing up that I thought I dealt with, and uh, I shared the dream that day uh, at, a, at a at a at at a conference that we had that night at a church, and uh, Matt c comes to that same prayer meeting because of a dream that he had about a man he, who was actually over the event. He didn't even know who this person was. He looks over the internet and actually finds him there. And so we become very good friends. We've been friends for, you know, almost you know, 14, 15 years now. Fast forward, Matt finds out that the Civil War, four years ago, he finds out that the Civil War ended in his family's front yard, oh. which is amazing. So here I am, this old kettle pot in my family where people prayed underneath it for freedom. We thought, man, what an amazing coincidence. You, here I have this kettle pot in my family where people prayed during the times of you know Civil War and everything. You have this house where the Civil War ended in your family's front yard. We thought, what an amazing coincidence. Then we stumbled on this research. You know how God is. And we stumbled on this research, and, and God reveals us. And we did a year and a half worth of research to make sure that you know all the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. And we, we learned that Matt's family is the family that owned my family, where that kettle pot came from. you got to be kidding me. 
And the thing is, we met at the Lincoln Memorial on MLK Celebration Day, both led by dreams, to the place where Dr. King said in his I Have a Dream speech, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners could sit together at the table of brotherhood. So I'm thinking, maybe the dream speech wasn't poetry. Maybe it was prophecy. Mm. Maybe right. there's a dream king himself. And that's why we named the book The Dream King. Because Matt and I were talking about this, and he said, maybe there's a dream king <laughs> who is the one who actually inspired Dr. King, who has this prayer in John 17 where he says, Father, I pray that they would be one so that, so that your glory could come, so that the world would believe. Maybe he's not giving up on America yet, and maybe he's working intensely and intently on healing the racial divide. I believe he is. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, just hearing that story is worth reading the book. The Dream King, but that as yeah, you that's said, just the tip of the, the iceberg. The tip of I mean, the it's, iceberg. It's, it's, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, so, 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 Matt, back back over to you. Weaving your perspective and and your your confidence in the providence of God that that God is actually doing something and weaving something together and bringing about His purpose in the midst of this human mess. Yeah, you know, uh, after I moved to D.C., I joined with uh, uh, a colleague of ours, Lou Engel here with the House of Prayer, and we've been praying for the ending of abortion for years, and uh, one of the things that God had showed us early on was uh, real vivid language concerning the, the American Civil War and the, the, the war that was fought to end the shedding of the innocent blood of the African, really. And so God had used a lot of similar language and had given us dreams through the years about that, and uh, we were going to do a gathering in Virginia. and. Uh, uh, we decided to go pray at Appomattox Courthouse before uh, we did that gathering. And so we, we went there and, and we prayed. And as we were getting ready to leave, we walked into the little visitor center that's there and uh, was standing next to my friend at this bookcase. And he grabs the first book off the shelf that caught his attention and uh, opens it to the first random page. And it was called The Battle of Lockett's Farm. <laughs> and, I, and that's my last name. And I was, yeah. he's like, what's this? And I had no idea. So I started researching it. And that's when I discovered that, that the, the final battle of the Civil War that Lee generally fought was in the front yard of a family named Lockett. Well, about that time, it was my older brother who finally did what no one in our family had ever done. He got the breakthrough on our family history. And he called me and he said, I, I got us all the way back to 1645. We came in as settlers through Virginia. And I, I said, well, man, have I got a Virginia story for you? And I started to tell him, and he stops me. and he. He says, that's not that place down by Appomattox, you know, this, this area called Sailor's Creek. And I said, well, that's exactly where it is. And he said, well, I just found the documents. That was our family. Sure. So that, that's wow. when things really began to open up was it, it wasn't just that we've been praying that language of the Civil War for all these years. Will and I had been running together for all these years. Then we find out that the war, the last battle actually happened in my family's front yard. And so that's when things really started getting interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, amazing. Uh, all right. Now, guys, you've been on the front lines of, of difficult causes, wanting to see racial reconciliation in America when it seems like in the last presidency and the current presidency, things are getting worse, that even though we see progress in the pro-life movement, the opposition is so adamant, and yet there's a spirit of faith in you. Some would say, well, you're just dreamers, but, but Will, <laughs> Matt, why do you believe that these are God's dreams and not just your dreams? What gives you faith and confidence to keep going? Well, one, for me, is the fact that God actually initiated all this in my life and in Matt's life. I mean, you know, we one thing that, that, that Mark made was just being a person of prayer and praying into these, praying into these things, but I had no idea and still have no idea all the things that God has unfolded and has yet unfolded with us in this whole story. For example, I mean, Matt, Matt and I just uh, two weekends ago, or this last weekend, you know, Dr. King said, I have a dream that one day on the radios of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would sit together at the table of brotherhood. Matt and I actually got a chance to share our story together and erect a table of brotherhood, do a, put a communion table on top of Stone Mountain in Georgia. Wow. Stone Mountain is the place where the Ku Klux Klan was rebirthed in 1915. And 
we got a chance to share our stories there. Dr. King said in that speech also, let freedom ring. I think that <clears throat> that, that whole speech and, uh, and there are aspects of it, if you study the history of it, uh, the little lady named Prathia Hall was actually one of the people who came up first with the with the phrase, I have a dream, in a prayer meeting. It was a prayer meeting they were having at a church that had been burned down by the Klan. Dr. King was in attendance, and he heard her saying, I have a dream. And it was after that he started using that phraseology in his speech for about a year before he actually said it in the March on Washington. In other words, that was birthed from a prayer meeting because I believe it was connected to the prayer that Jesus has that's on his heart. Father, I pray that they be one so that your glory could come so that the world will believe. The Father is going to answer the Son's prayer, Dr. Brown. You mm-hmm. and I know it. And that's what's, that's what's so intriguing about this. Everybody's talking about the narratives that are out there right now in this nation, but there's a meta-narrative. It's God's, it's God's narrative. He has a storyline that he's we- where he's weaving all these things together, and he's working all things together together for our good because there are people who called according to his purpose who are united to what he wants to do in the place of intercession and action. And so that's what that's what gives me hope. Amen. And, and Matt, we've got, oh, a minute and a half. What are you hoping that readers will experience as they read The Dream King? Uh, it would be this. Uh, you asked uh, just a moment ago, like, why, you know, do people just say you're just a bunch of dreamers? Listen, don't discount the dreams from God. Mark Rutland describes yeah. them and says, he says, Dreams from God are a hearty thing. Mm. They can last in storms. And I would say this, that, that don't just say it's just a dream. Mm. You don't know what angels had to fight through to get that dream to you in your mm. sleep at night. So listen, I, I just would encourage your listeners, don't say it's just a dream. I think dreams from God uh, have a sustaining power. They, they help us understand our pain. It's a guiding constellation for our lives, and they point us in the directions we're supposed to go and the lives we're supposed to live. And, you know, I, I just want to throw this in. You guys will love this. Uh, I've been listening to the Bible on audio recently and started with one translation in Genesis, and I was listening also to another audio book, depending on whether I was driving in one direction or another, and decided, oh, you know, I need to go back to, to the Scripture. And, of course, what is it? It's about... The, the Joseph in prison and the dreams of the guys there and Joseph interpreting dreams. And this just driving up to the, to the studio today. And then about Pharaoh's dreams that I'm having them twice. And when it, it, God's showing it twice and the importance of it. And of course it leads to the unfolding of biblical history and it, and it came through dreams. So I, I completely yeah. had that in my yeah. mind that, that we were going to be talking about dream King as, as I drove <laughs> in and it, it, just a reminder, friends, this is in the Bible in the last days that, that young men will yeah. see visions, old men will dream dreams. And if, if the thing yeah. is there and it stays with you, it stays yeah, with it you, maybe God's putting it there. And guys, I appreciate your perseverance. I remember being there at J-Hop in D.C. right in the early days, and you were going for it. You, you've still been going for it, and it's because God's sustaining. God's going to do impossible things. Get the book, friends, Dream King by Will Ford and Matt Lockett. Guys, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Yep, you can go to Amazon, you can go to uh, Barnes & Noble, you can also go to DreamStreamCompany.com and get the book. All right, God bless.